Hello and welcome to Creating Disciples with me, Austin Roberts. We are so excited to have you join us today as we are going to be taking a look at one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. To be specific, we're going to look at the church in the city of Sardis. So we are so happy to have you join us today, and we hope that you enjoy the message that God has brought to each and every one of us. Have you ever done something, been somewhere, eaten something that wasn't as good as advertised? It was supposed to be very good, but then it turned out to be eh, mediocre, perhaps. I remember a while back going out with some friends to eat. And we were walking up and down uh, the downtown of this little town, and we came upon this bakery. And so we decided to go in and get some different things to eat and to drink. And as I was looking at the glass case there that displayed all the different things that we could eat, I zeroed in on one specific dessert. I saw it there and I thought, that's the one. And it was this dessert called flan. Now, I don't know if you've ever had flan, but it is a Hispanic dessert that's like this little cake or pie almost that's made out of like, you know, condensed milk and sugar and caramel. And it is very, very good. Well, I decided to get that and I thought, this is gonna be a great experience. I've had this before and I cannot wait to have it again. Well, I got it and I got a fork, you know, and a knife and cut it and began to dig in and I took this bite that was greatly anticipated, and it was terrible. It was the worst plan I had ever had. And I couldn't believe it. It looked so good in the display case. And I thought, are you kidding me? I spent this money and this time waiting in anticipation, and this is what I get? I couldn't believe it. It was terrible, to be frank. I did not like it. And maybe you've been there. Maybe you've been somewhere where you expected something great and it didn't quite turn out to be what you had thought. It reminds me of when I go grocery shopping sometimes when I am hungry. If you go grocery shopping when you're hungry, that is not a well-advised decision. It is unwise for sure. Well, every once in a while, I'll go grocery shopping when I'm hungry. I'll push that cart around and I'll end up putting so many things in that cart so much fruit and vegetables and frozen pizzas and ice creams and dessert and juice and all these different things in the cart. And then I'll head for the cash register and pay the money and go home and then I'll make something and I'll eat it and then I'll feel full. And once I feel full, I will look at all the things I've just bought and think, oh boy, this, I'm never going to finish all this before some of these things go sour or rotten and Eventually, you know, within a week or so, some of the bread will grow mold and the milk will get sour and things will go bad and we'll have to throw things away. You know how it is. Don't go shopping when you're hungry because then you will set yourself up with an impression or an idea that is unrealistic. You will think it's going to be great and then it won't turn out as great as you thought it was going to. Have you ever been there in that type of situation? Well, I have. And it's not a great place to be, although I've been there before. It reminds me of a time a number of years ago during an NFL draft season. And in the NFL draft, what happens in football is that every year, different teams will pick different players that they want. And every year, the team that was the worst team the previous year goes first, and the second worst team goes second, and so on and so forth till the very end. And they'll do this in rounds until everyone has picked. Well, this particular year, there were a couple of great quarterbacks coming out of college that everyone anticipated would have great careers, maybe even some of the best ever. And one of those quarterbacks you have probably heard of, and his name is Peyton Manning. And the other quarterback is probably a quarterback you much fewer of you have heard of, and his name was Ryan Leaf. Well, the Indianapolis Colts had the very first pick of the draft that year, and they were deciding between these two players, and they weren't sure who they were going to pick, and they went back and forth, and 
did interviews and saw them play and watch film and tape on them. And finally, they decided to pick Peyton Manning. Well, the next team that was picking was the San Diego Chargers at that time. And they thought, all right, well, the Colts chose Manning, so we will take Ryan Leaf. And they chose Ryan Leaf. Well, Manning went on to become one of the greatest quarterbacks to have ever played, widely considered to be probably one of the top five. Well, Ryan Leaf ended up being the biggest bust that had ever been in NFL draft history. He got a reputation for being lazy, didn't work hard, had a bad diet, got in trouble with the law a couple times. He ended up throwing double the amount of interceptions than touchdowns that he threw. He completed less than 50% of his passes. He was a bust. He was a bad player. Have you ever had something that you thought was going to be great and then turned out not to be so good after all? Well, the Chargers knew what that was like, and maybe you know what that's like. I've been in situations like that before. You probably have been too. Well, today, we're going to open up to a part of the text that talks a little bit about something like that. We're opening to the third chapter of Revelation, and we're going to read the letter to the church in Sardis. But before we read that letter, let's talk about Sardis itself. Sardis was a city that was kind of on a flat plateau at the very end of a valley. And it was widely considered to be impregnable. You could not take Sardis by force because of the position in which it was. Sardis also was a place to have said legendary wealth. People there were incredibly rich and wealthy. They wanted for nothing, and they could have anything. Now, in this context, we have the Christian church, and a Christian church that was probably affected at some level or another by the culture and the atmosphere in Sardis. You see, by the time we get to this place in history, Sardis was a mere shadow of what it had once been. You see, it had been invaded successfully a couple of times despite its great position. And you know why? It was invaded successfully because they just left nobody to watch the battlements. And they just were taken over. They thought they were in a place that no one would come for them because they were in, in a place that was so strong that they were invaded successfully anyway. They had become so comfortable in their wealth and in their luxury that they thought, we'll be fine. Nothing's going to happen to us. And it was that attitude of, uh, whatever, good enough, nobody cares, that eventually was their downfall. And so as you can imagine, the Christian church, the people there in Sardis, were kind of affected by this attitude as well. So with that idea in mind, with something that looks oh so good on the outside, or, but that might be rotten on the inside like this city of Sardis, we're going to read here. We're going to read the first three verses, verses one to three of Revelation three, and see what Jesus says to this city and this church. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. This is one of the only letters in this collection of seven where Jesus has nothing good to say at all. Later on, we will notice that he has a couple of good things to say about some of the specific people in the church. But about the church as a whole, it is harsh and it is pointed. There is nothing good to say about this church in Sardis. Now, it kind of parallels the city if you think about it. It looks oh so great on the outside, but this church does not fool Jesus. You notice it there in the text. 
He says it in a few different ways. He says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains. So Jesus is no fool. He knows what's going on here. The looks on the outside of this church, e, as great as they may be, do not fool Jesus. And he says, wake up, liven yourselves, because I know what you're like on the inside. Many years ago, in the 1980s, if I remember correctly, there was a lady by the name of Kitty Genovese. And she finished her, her shift at a New York bar at around 2.30 in the morning and began to make her way home. She arrived at her apartment complex, the parking lot, about 45 minutes later. And when she got there, she was stabbed. She was stabbed by one Winston Mosley. And as he did so, a bystander somewhere yelled at him to stop, and so he ran away. And Genevieve tried to make her way back to her apartment, but Mosley was not deterred. He came back to finish what he had started, and he continued to stab her and to kill her. Well, it would be hours later at about 4.15 in the morning that Genevieve would die en route to the hospital. And the New York Times and other news outlets would report the next morning that throughout the span of this attack, there were about 38 people who witnessed it and said nothing. Not a single thing. No calls to the police. No call to an ambulance. No real attempt to stop Mosley despite Genevieve's screams and cries for help. Nothing. Now, later on, studies would be done on this, and this would be titled the bystander effect, or the Genovese syndrome. And later studies would also note that there were probably, in reality, about a dozen people who witnessed this crime in some capacity or another. But the point still stands. They're there, they see what's going on, but they do nothing. There's nothing to be done, they think. Whatever. We'll just let it happen. It'll be fine. And that's kind of the attitude that these people here in this city of Sardis have. And Jesus says, wake up. Just do something. Come on. But they do nothing. But Jesus then doesn't stop there. He has specific instructions for this city, for this church. He says, there are some things you can do to remedy your situation. There are four things, in fact, four things he says in the text that we've read that they can do to help themselves. Four things. The first thing he says is remember. Remember what it was like when you first became Christians. Remember what it was like when you began to follow Christ. The excitement and the anticipation that you had, the readiness to do the right thing. Remember that. When I was a freshman in college, I remember being very excited to start. I remember that first day, getting ready, getting up early, you know, getting a shower, picking clothes, getting my backpack, my binder, my books, all the things I would need for class. I remember bringing extra pens and pencils, extra paper in the binder to take notes. I was ready. I remember going through those first few classes and being excited, learning new things. It was a good time. I enjoyed that a great deal. But that example, however, is held in great contrast to the last day of senior year. That day was very different. I rolled out of bed 10 minutes before class started, grabbed the closest pair of sweats and a hat, maybe a pencil on the way out, trudged to class, kind of half awake still, to take that last test. It was just different. The first day of class of college, as opposed to the last day of college, were just different experiences. And Jesus says, remember. Remember how it was at first when you were so excited, so ready. You had everything lined up and ready to go. You were up early. You did what you needed to do to be prepared and to be ready. Well, says Jesus to this church in Sardis, remember that. Remember what that was like. Remember that experience, the love you had for this church and for Christ. Remember. But he doesn't stop there. 
He says a second thing, and he says, obey. He says, hold fast the commandments. Obey what I have told you. Keep these commandments. Now, if we go back to the original language of this text, the original Greek, we'll notice something interesting. And that is that when he commands them to obey the commandments, he uses the aorist imperative tense. Now, if we were to translate that as accurately as we could, and we're going to look at this text, remember he says, hold it fast. Now, if we were to translate that in the aorist uh, imperative tense, it would probably be better translated as hold it fast and keep holding it fast forever. So he's not just saying keep the commandments. He's saying keep the man commandments and keep keeping the commandments forever. It's not just a one-time thing. It's a lifetime thing. Keep the commandments and don't stop keeping the commandments. That's important. I grew up as a child in the home of a pastor. And I loved my growing up years. And my parents set a wonderful example of what it meant to be a follower of Christ, to be a Christian. You see, they weren't just followers of Christ for four hours on a Saturday when it was time for church. They were always that way. They were that way at home and at work and at friends' houses and at the bowling alley or the theater or the coffee shop or wherever we went. They always held that standard of following Christ and living that life. And that was a really, really important example for my sister and I to watch. You see, keeping the commandments is not a one-time decision where you say, okay, I'm going to keep the commandments in this very moment. Keeping the commandments as has been commanded in this text is a forever thing. It's a lifetime thing. Keeping the commandments means doing it day in and day out. It means doing it when it's easy and when it's hard. It means doing it when everyone's watching and when no one's watching. It means doing it around the people that you know well and are comfortable with and the people who you've never seen before and don't know at all. Keeping the commandments is a big deal. And that's what Jesus commands them to do here. He says, keep them, but don't just keep them in one moment. Keep them forever. So first he has said, remember. Remember what it was like when you first began to follow. And then he has said, obey. Keep those commandments. They are important. But there's a third thing here, a third thing that he says that can remedy their situation, and that is repent. Repent. Stop doing what you were doing. Change your ways and turn around. Face the other direction. A story is told of Rodney Gypsy Smith, the famous missionary. And Smith says that when he was doing mission work in South Africa, a Dutchman came to work for him. And this Dutchman in particular had just converted and had just become a follower of Christ. And the next morning, he went and knocked on the door of a fellow Dutchman and presented to that fellow Dutchman a watch. And he said, here, do you recognize this watch? And that fellow Dutchman looked down at it and said, why, yes, I do recognize this watch. I lost it eight years ago. In fact, look here, it even has my initials on it. He asked, where did you get it? How did you come upon this watch? How did you find it? How long have you had it? Well, the first Dutchman responded and said, well, eight years ago, I stole it. But last night, I converted to following Christ. And if you had been awake last night, I would have brought it to you then. But you were not, so I brought it to you first thing this morning. And that is repentance. That is changing your behavior from doing one thing to doing the opposite thing. And that is what Jesus is commanding this church to do. He says, repent, change your ways, stop doing what you were doing, and instead follow me. And so he said three things so far. First, he has said, remember what it was like when you first became a follower of Christ. And second, he has said, obey, hold these commandments fast. Hold them now and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and forever. And then he has said, repent, change your ways, stop doing what you were once doing and repent. And then the fourth and final thing he says is wake up. 
be awake. And when he says that, being awake means to be faithful. It means to be faithful at all times, even when it is tough. James Dobson and Gary Lee Bauer, in one of their books, tell a story. Tell a story of a bombing in Beirut, one of the most tragic stories in the Reagan administration of a Marine Corps base. And when that happened, one of the Marine Corps commandants, Commandant Kelly, went to visit some of the soldiers who had been severely injured. And they were being held at a hospital in Frankfurt, Germany. So the commandant went to visit these soldiers. And as he made his way into the rooms and between the beds, he came upon one corporal, James Nashton. And Nashton, it is said by a witness, looked more like a machine than a human because of all the tubes and needles and IVs running in and out of him. And there, as he lay, his body racked with pain from head to toe, no doubt, Nashton requested a piece of paper and a pencil. And so he was given that, and as he lay there in the bed, hardly even able to move, he wrote there on that piece of paper, Semper Fi, which is the Latin motto of the Marine Corps, and it means forever faithful. And that's what these people are being called to here. Be forever faithful in every waking and sleeping moment. Jesus says, be faithful. And so Jesus comes to this church and he sees them for what they are. They look good on the outside. They are wealthy and comfortable. But he knows what they are really like on the inside. They are not how they look. They are in trouble. And he says, listen, I know you for who you really are and you are going to need to change some things. First, remember how it was back when you first began to follow Christ. You don't remember. You are like that no longer. There is no excitement and joy in being a Christian. Remember what that was like, he says. And then secondly, don't just remember, but also obey. Obey the commands that I have laid out for you. And that is going to mean obeying them forever. It's not a one-time decision, a single thing that you do, but it is a for everything. Obey the commands. Hold them fast. Hold them fast and keep holding them fast. And then third, he says, repent of your ways. You are doing things one way. I need you to turn around and do them the other way. Repent of what you have done. Change your ways. And then finally, he says, wake up. Be faithful. Being faithful isn't always an easy journey. It can mean pain and suffering, and for some, it will even mean death. But be a people that are faithful. Right now, it is easy for you to be faithful. You live in great comfort and luxury in the city of Sardis, he says. You've been surrounded by things that many other people don't have the opportunities and the privilege to be surrounded by, and yet you have become soft. It is time for you to wake up. It's time for you to be faithful. So let's finish reading the text. Verses 4 to 6. Jesus has some final things to say here. He says this, Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there are a few, a select few, who have not soiled their clothes, as the text says. In fact, there is a word that is used here that is interesting, and it is the word worthy. And once again, if we return to the original language, worthy means something interesting. You see, the word that is used here in Revelation is the same word, worthy, that would have been used in the marketplace or in the grocery store when they would have measured things to buy. 
And that process would have gone something like this. Let's say you wanted to buy salt. So you would go out and you would buy, you would go to the merchant, to the vendor, and say, I want three ounces of salt. And so that merchant, that vendor, would bring out a scale, set the scale down, and the scale would have two different plates on it. And on the one plate, he would put a weight that weighed three ounces. And then on the other plate, he would start to add salt. And he would add salt until the scale balanced. And then those three ounces of salt would be worthy. And so that is the terminology that is used here, that is used by Jesus. Jesus says, I have brought out the heavenly scale and I have put the weight of faithfulness on this side. And then I have put you on the other side. And as I have weighed that back and forth, you have weighed out correctly. You are worthy. And so he says that to this church, to these people here in Sardis, but he says that is only true of a few. He says, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me. They are worthy. And so the truth is, he's not talking to everybody in that moment. He's talking to a few. So for the rest of us, to those of us who look good on the outside but are rotten on the inside, who have tried to skate by with the comfort and the wealth and the luxury, we've got some work to do. We've got to remember what it was like when we first began to follow Christ. The joy we had, the excitement we held, the anticipation we felt when we first began to follow Christ. We've got to remember that. We've got to obey the commandments he has laid out, each and every single one. Don't cast them by the wayside on the path, but obey them. We must repent. We must turn from the people who we once were and repent of our evil ways. And then finally, it's time to wake up. It's time to be faithful. It's time to follow that path. And there are a select few out there who have been faithful all the time. Probably not you and probably not me. So it's time for us to make that move and to be people of faith as we have been called and as the people there in the church of Sardis have been called. So it's time. Are you ready to be a person of faith? Are you ready to make those moves? I hope so. Thank you so much for joining us today on Creating Disciples. We hope you have a wonderful and blessed day as a faithful person.